Um, <laughs> I'm Dan Donaghy from the English department, and before I uh, turn it over to the person who's going to do the introduction, I just want to uh, give thanks to some people uh, without whose help this, this could not have happened. First, everyone associated with the University Hour uh, and their, their generous funding of this uh, visit by Dr. Jake Adam York. Thank uh, Dr. Paul Bryant, Vice President of Student Affairs, who uh, has, has allowed us to, um, he's helped it in a number of ways. Um, most recently, by allowing us to um, have some students uh, dine with Mr. York and, and get to know him informally as well as in the classroom and as well as uh, tonight through the reading. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Rona Free. Thank the English Chair, uh, Dr. Elena Tapia, and all of my colleagues in the English Department who've, who've spread the word about, about Dr. York and, and who are here tonight or here in spirit. I know um, at least one person couldn't be here tonight but came to the University Hour and that that really means a lot. I know it means a lot to, to, to Jake and, and certainly to me. Um, the backbone of, of all things administrative in the English department, I hope I don't offend people by saying that, but Miranda Lau, the English department the secretary, uh, who did so many things in, in helping us get ready for this, along with the student workers, Alicia Chandler, uh, Julie Bass, and Katie D'Antonio. Uh, thank the English club also for helping get the word out. And thanks, as always, to, to the bookstore, to, to Brent Terry and his cohorts, and uh, Ben Blake and everyone associated with the bookstore for helping us out. And uh, also, I want to make sure I give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Carmen Sid, uh, the Dean of, of Arts and Sciences, for her continued support of, of the English department, her continued support of, of uh, writers visiting Eastern. OK, a little breaking script a little bit. Uh, if, if you were at the, the Adnizio reading, uh, I gave the introduction. And right now, I wanted to introduce, this is much easier, um, is I want to introduce the person doing the introduction. Uh, as Alexa has, has done a terrific job in putting together an introduction. The uh, person doing the introduction uh, has worked hard to, to do it, and uh, please join me first in welcoming Alexa Salon, who's an English major and writing minor. So, Alexa Salon. Good evening. Jake Adam York is the author of a book of criticism, The Architecture of Address, the Monument and Public Speech in American Poetry, as well as two books of poetry. His first book, Murder Ballads, won the fifth annual Elixir Press Award in 2005 and was a semi-finalist for the Academy of American Poets Walt Whitman Award. His second book, A Murmuration of Starlings, won a Crab Orchard Series and Poetry Open Competition Award. Both books, both books pay great reverence to the civil rights era, and it is clear through Mr. York's, Dr. York's poems, just how evident Birmingham and Montgomery linger in the roots of his early childhood. Raised near Gadsden, Alabama, Dr. York studied architecture and English at Auburn University before furthering his study in creative writing and English literature at Cornell. His poems have appeared in journals such as Diagram, Gulf Coast, Hangman, New Orleans Review, Shenandoah, Southern Review, Blackbird, and Greensboro Review. Currently, he's in charge of creative writing at the University of Colorado in Denver and works closely with his students on their literary journal, Copper Nickel. Acclaimed poet and fiction writer Robert Morgan has called Dr. York one of the most exciting new voices in American poetry. Pulitzer Prize winning author Natasha Trethewey has described Dr. York's poems as fierce and beautiful as well as fearless in their reckoning. She goes on to say that these poems resurrect contested histories and show us that the past, with its troubled beauty, its erasures, and its violence, weighs upon us all. In regards to York, Dr. York's latest book, A Murmuration of Starlings, the Alabusha Review has said that the collection avoids oversimplifying the individual struggles of the civil rights era, refusing the easy binaries of innocence and guilt, goodness and badness, self and other. Poet Major Jackson says that with a lucid, shrewd intelligence and a commanding vision of healing and atonement, Jake Adam York makes an offering of images and music that seems the foundation of a new understanding and remembrance. Immediately after I read this book, I thought of Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit. Both are very melodic, very sweet, and yet they involve these horrific, specific scenes. People being lynched or beat up or shot in the head, their houses destroyed, their churches bombed. Both Miss Holiday and Dr. York capture these horrors with startling eloquence. Dr. York's poems contain a beautiful, haunting lyricism. He's willing to confront ugliness here. 
But instead of scaring away readers, we only become more entranced, more involved, because he has given these victims faces and voices. He presents not only horror in these poems, but meaning. That's the power they hold. Dr. York has given voices to Lamar Smith, Emmett Till, and the victims of Dynamite Hill. I didn't know these people, and I didn't know these stories. But from reading these poems, I was compelled to do the research and look further in. Some may, seem, some may find it ironic that these poems are written by a Caucasian male from the South. Some readers may ask how, as a white man, can he identify with the struggles of black people who died before he was born? Questions such as this, though, point toward Dr. York's greatest strength as a writer, the ability to empathize. And for Dr. York, things aren't strictly black and white. Take Mamie Till, for instance, who had the, struggle, who had the strength to demand an open casket for her bludgeoned 14-year-old son so that the world could see what had happened to him. In situations such as this, it's not color people pay attention to. It's the fact that this has happened to a human being a little boy, no less. In writing his poems, Dr. York transcends race and focuses on those bare qualities that make us human. Tonight, I ask you to join me in welcoming to Eastern, Dr. Jake Adam York. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you, everyone who's here tonight. Um, and thank, thanks again to all the people Dan thanked for uh, writing the checks and supporting this sort of event. Um, it's a great, it's really a great pleasure to see um, a room so filled with people <coughs> who are ready to listen. So um, I hope I don't squander, um, squander your generosity here. Um, so. The first poem I'm going to read is called From a Field Guide to Etowah County, and um, I think it tells you everything you'll need to know. Bluets, larkspur, common violets in the jimson and Queen Anne's lace, tangles of boxwood and honeysuckle and smilax and hydrangea and pine, a thick from which spring azures drift among the first to emerge. Then swallowtails gunmetal iridescence, obsidian with stars' wings, turning like pages in hands of wind. Thrashers tear in the leaves for earthworms, salamanders, some morsel, their stipple of sunlight and leaves blending, then reappearing in a crash of meal. If a snake uncurls, the bird will leaf it in Bibles of territory and protection, and someone's aunt or grandmother passing will pause to note that summer is on us early but this one merely stands, its wing an array. Feathers, a concrete model of grain and pebble, like a roadside table turned into brush long ago. Here, there is no split persimmon or cankered plum, no sap or juice to bead mimeograph bright on the grass's nibs. And the grass does not whirl in cursives of moonlight and dark each night, but this is where they found that postman from Baltimore walking his integration letter to Ross Barnett, 300 miles to go, shot in his head and neck, copies of the protest scattered and streaking in the April dew. It was September, honeysuckle in full perfume, the woods a riot of grackles and jays when the grand jury broke and let the suspect go. The facts are simple, my grandfather said. The DA said we couldn't make a case. So the words they never wrote coiled into field reports and requisitions. And three days later, a church bomb in Birmingham blew the stained glass face of Christ like a dandelion head in the roadside weeds. Snake root, aster, and blazing star, some toxic to cows should not be eaten, though many take the greens and fruit of poke more abundant in spring as correctives, small poisons to set things right. Goldenrod blazes the highway shoulders all the way to Birmingham or Chattanooga, and starlings gather like glass, like grackles in the trees, such sociability in advance of colder weather. The swallowtails and azures have disappeared, 
but you may spot the great purple hair streak, bumbling, slow and easy to observe. Even in the clouds of goldenrod that dust when they land, the cones are brilliant, but delicate as their gossamer wings touch and the colors written in your skin. Now, as Alexa noted, um, much of the project of my poetry is uh, a kind of recovery, if you will. Um, the civil rights movement is punctuated, according to some accounts, by the, uh, the murders or the, um, the violent beatings um, of, in particular, 41 people um, whose suffering is remembered on the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. And um, as I was saying in the University Hour earlier today, um, from the very first time I visited there, I've been struck by the fact that there's an overwhelming feeling that you should know who these people were and what their lives were like before these moments of suffering and that you should know the facts of this suffering, but also a sad realization that in many cases the silence that surrounded that suffering um, simply continues today. And so a lot of these poems seek to reach back into those particular moments, those horrific moments, and to look um, at the facts of those moments so they don't, uh, they're not left to silence, basically. So I'm going to read two poems with the same title. Um, these are both called At Liberty. In the town of Liberty, Mississippi, um, in 1961, a man named Herbert Lee was murdered by a state congressman in broad daylight. And... Um, he just walked away, manufactured witnesses who later recanted their stories. And uh, one of the witnesses who uh, wouldn't play along was murdered uh, three years later on the, on the night before he was supposed to leave town for good. So, At Liberty, 1961. Everyone will say he drove to the gin with a truck full of cotton. So he drives to the gin and gets in line and everyone will say the congressman pulled in behind him. So he gets out yelling, Herbert Lee, I'm not messing with you this time. And his affidavit will say Lee had a tire iron. And there are no photographs, so there is a tire iron. And since the congressman will say Lee swung at him, his hand will grasp the iron under the tangle of his own dead weight. And the congressman will leave and will not see him again, so he just lies there bleeding for a time, and no one will touch him, so he is just a story, or a huddle of starlings, or crows, or a cloud of bottle flies that might explode and disappear, until the witnesses can say he's there, and an undertaker can come with a hearse from the next county over, and then he is dead, and the congressman can tell his story. So Herbert Lee will rise from his coffin and swing his iron, and the FBI will come to make him into evidence. But someone will have roped him into his grave already, so there is no photograph. And no one sees the cotton bowl wicking blood, so there is no bowl, only a clear white negative in the dark and a paper that slowly fills with flies. At Liberty, 1964. This is for a man named Lewis Allen. The morning train is turning like a compass needle. Now the night has folded all its schedules into the stands of pine and cedar, all its innumerable wings. And tomorrow he will be gone from the lumber yards and the farmhouse windows that semaphore like televisions and the vacant hands of Herbert Lee and the killer and the quiet of having never seen a thing. Quietly now, while the truck is idling. Dark decides from all the county's limbs, shattering into birds that shatter, then collapse to his skin. Beaks lace eardrum and eardrum, his cheeks, his tongue, their obsidians needling for what he's seen, what he would surely tell, so he won't have to see it, so he won't have to whisper it even once ever again. I'm going to read a longer poem now. Um, 
this, these poems are not just recovery poems. They're also uh, poems that seek to like trace out the logic of the various uh, lies and so forth that are also a part of the history of the civil rights movement or specifically uh, white resistance to the movement. And uh, the greatest example of this is in the trial of the killers of Emmett Till, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant, who uh, essentially create, had their defense create an alternate universe uh, in which all sorts of strange things were supposed to have happened. And because the jury acquitted those men, in a sense, the jury um, accepted and realized this strange vision of Mississippi, which um, would later turn out obviously not to be true when these two men who were acquitted confessed in a popular magazine. Uh, so I went back to the trial transcript and I wanted to write a poem in which all of the things that were said by, on the defense side and on the prosecution side were true at the same time. Uh, and so this is a very confused poem about a very confused place called Mississippi. And uh, two little epigraphs here. Uh, Mamie Till said in 1955 that she was appalled by, quote, the way the jury chose to believe the ridiculous stories of the defense. And in the magazine, uh, Look, Where the Killers Confessed, um, William Bradford Huey wrote, with truth absent, hypocrisy and myth have flourished. And so we'll see these things reverberate off of each other. And there are lots of different voices in here, but I just kind of do them all straight through. This is called substantiation. The sheriff says, it wasn't till we pulled from the river. That man was as white as I am. White as cotton gin weighed by the cotton gin fan that weighed him down. Looked like he'd lain there weeks, not a kid at all. He was a stranger just out of money, recalled by a store clerk, a hobo, and a crossroads guitarist. They say, it's like the sheriff says, came up one night, headed Clarksdale way, another one hat pulled down right behind. Three days later, the blues man says, a plague of starlings gathered into little boys, those who fished and found the dead man's foot. The reporter stares into his cataracted cotton eyes. He cannot find them, no matter where he looks. The sheriff says, this man's killer is on the loose, and a killer emerges. A child watching from a sleeping porch catches a rustle in the bushes, and soon everyone is on the hunt, while in the courtroom, Someone is wondering about this poor murdered family. Who's missing him? And the next day, his father appears unknown for work, his name on the payroll, then gets to work on a machine no one's ever seen. And someone is weeping on the Tallahatchie's bank, a little girl who wished her mother would die, whose mother died at the hands of this stranger she's followed till he stepped in the river and disappeared. The reporter asks for two tight Collins at the Charlestown jail, and the sheriff says, who? Asks why he's got him, then sees the bullet on his tongue. Asks directions back to Greenwood and finds himself down Greenville Way instead. Takes back roads back to Mound Bayou, a wrong, wrong turn to Parchman Farm where guards rifle from the woods. A change at the eavesdrop end, then he's bent picking cotton in a field. Come sundown, he hobo Sumner way and squats at courthouse windows where the sheriff shuffles cards for a blind man in the defense team. At a levee camp that night, he asks for whiskey and she gives him a cup of names. He wires his paper. He's gone catfish fishing on the Tallahatchie that he won't be coming home. The defense says, Till's alive and well on Detroit streets. And someone's sure they've seen him just off the train from Memphis Porter sneaking him out the back, and now he's walking incognito, a worn fedora raked to shade the one eye. A cruiser eases through the streets, searchlight in doorways, the driver white, dressed like a cop, but for the rope marks at his throat, the bullet in his eye. He has a mush mouth accent, talks water when he speaks, slept in a box from Greenville to Chicago with another man's name, a name he's ready to give up now. If Till is alive and well, he can't rest in Burr Oak Cemetery. Will cruise where he's been said to be on the Detroit streets where everyone knows he's coming since he whistles like a train on the way out of town. They say it was darker than a thousand midnights in the cabin. They couldn't find him in the dark. They say Moses brought him out at last. 
that someone else was in the truck to say that it was him that did the talk at money. They say they took him for a ride just to rough him up, scare him on a river bluff, then let him go. They say they let him off near Glendora, never seen again. They say, ain't it like a Negro to swim the river with a gin fan round his neck? They say it was hog's blood in the truck what too tight washed. They say they never burnt no shoes. It was a barbecue. They say too tight never worked for them. They never heard of Willie Reed. They say they never meant to harm the boy. They didn't do a thing. The defense says, Mamie Till knows her son's alive and well. She knows the body isn't his. That her lawyers came in weeks ago and dug a body up and used it for their own. They found fresh graves. That a Yazoo City widow found her husband's gone and Lazarus ain't walking back through Green Eden, Greenwood, Itabina. Jesus Christ ain't come. And every left floor county lawyer can't be wrong. One juror says, he knows it. Seen rights workers take their shovels out along the roads at night. The Sheriff Strider's right that it's the northern poison got this all stirred up. Though a black might be fool enough to swim with a gin fan round his neck, this one wasn't one that they should sit a while and drink a pop to make it look right, to make it look real. In the nervous ward, Reed remembers Milam with the gun asking, did he hear anything? Reed remembers saying, no, he didn't hear anything, anything remembers not hearing the beating and the crying in the shed behind Milam's, remembers not thinking they beaten someone up there, remembers not passing the shed, not hearing the beating, remembers not remembering Milam, not coming out, not asking if he'd heard, remembers not not remembering on the stand, not not whispering the court reporter, not not recording his not not remembered memory, not getting on the train now, not hearing anything, anything, such quiet now. The reporter, here's Bryant, has been bragging how he got away with murder. A few months back, no one could make them, and now they're seen at the cabin, at the bridge. Their alibis are gone. The stranger emerges from the river, then disappears. The little girl's mother rises from her grave, home just in time for dinner. Emmett Till boards a freight in Detroit and hobos to his grave outside Chicago. The crossroads station and its clerk disappear again, and the hat disappears. Anywhere else, the reporter would have been called to the disappearing, but here, there's nothing left to say. Bryant's smile broadens as he retells it, how they were heroes, how they murdered Till. And when the look comes out, the town already knows, no one ever speaks to them again. When the contractor guts the courthouse basement, the fan and the transcript are laid out on the street. Junk men salvage metal, and the papers warp and tear in the rain. Starlings pick through the gutter's wreck and weave typescript fragments into their nests. Emmett Till watches and wreathes their broods. Milan wakes up early each morning when the riot in the pear trees begins. Starlings wolf whistling for food, or just repeating what they've heard. One pair is woven strips of look Bryant spreads throughout the woods. In 20 years, no one's come. He opens a shotgun on the starlings' calls each morning, and they spray like smoke or blood. But they regather and whistle overhead and shit back shot as they fly. That's my hope in this book, uh, if, if you decide to read it, um, even though I say that some of you have already been assigned to read it, uh, so you didn't really have much choice in the matter, and I apologize. <laughs> but it's my hope in this book that in the first half of the book that these starlings that show up and give the book its title can be seen as the uh, kind of visualization of the residue of violence. The premise of the book is that any time violence is done, particularly violence done in the service of hatred, um, there's an effect that goes into the environment. It goes into the language, it goes into the culture, and it doesn't go away. It's a kind of residue. And the starlings for me are a perfect natural image for this phenomenon because starlings in a way are a kind of residue as well. Um, introduced into the country in 1890, um, from 80 birds come 250 million birds today. 
But this book is not just about showing like the overwhelming volume of the accretion of that violence, but also to show how, um, or show the wisdom of the people who were able to pull that, the power of that um, accretion of violence and hatred and to turn it back the other way. And so the last half of this book is really about taking those starlings that are the creatures of violence and turning them into the creatures of resistance. So I'm going to read two poems. Um, first, the title poem, uh, which recounts the, the beating and the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson in uh, Marion, Alabama in 1965, an event that led directly, if not quickly, to the march from Selma to Montgomery. Um, a lot of people have the images of the march in their, in their memory. Uh, a lot of people know about it. Um, but I think in many cases, the feeling is that the march is simply um, demonstrative and political, but it's also elegiac. Um, the march started when Jimmy Lee Jackson, who was a young um, college student whose um, grandfather and mother lived in Marion, was back working on, on uh, his family farm. And um, he was murdered in this riot that was instigated by the state patrol. And his brother was so angry that he had the idea they would take Jimmy Lee Jackson's body all the way to Montgomery and lay, lay it on the steps of the Capitol so that George Wallace could see, quote, uh, what he had set in motion. Uh, and the march is that, that act symbolically, the march to carry Jimmy Lee Jackson to, um, to Montgomery. So this poem's called A Murmuration of Starlings, and this, this is a tells um, the events of that night. Um, starts with him in the hospital, goes back, and then moves forward again. A murmuration of starlings. A cloud of starlings drifts from the river. At first, a smudge on the sky or the hospital window, then more definite, contracting than scattering like pain. Nuns, ghosts, white robed as night riders in the farm edge pines, haunting the forest along the river, like lilies on the Cahaba shoals. Whenever he wakes, someone else is there just out of view, prayer drowned in the rasp of breath, a song like breaking glass. Wings clench in the fluorescent tubes, flutter of shadows, the state patrol colonel darkening the bed, handcuffs on the rail, a warrant for a tongue. Then wings, blown smoke, gathering somewhere just out of view. At the church, just after dark, hymns, then the night march across the square to sing through jailhouse windows in February to their brother, who can hear them in their pews, can hear them descend to the waiting mayor and police chief, the state troopers who bullhorn them back. When the reverend kneels to pray, one patrol and swings his club, all the lights go down. Photograph strobes carve their bodies from the dark break and pucker of surge and wool on arms boxed to catch the blows. Night sticks straight from the flex of uniform sleeves, coats taut between the blades, white helmets gleam, and above, a heaven of breath and steam and smoke from which dark feathers then spreads, coughing dense night air at the cusp of the lens, carving through the barrel to spread the shutters blind. No one sees the congregation scatter or the troopers chase to the river or church or blockhouse cafe. No one sees the bottles flying as they climb the stairs or the bricks in the troopers' affidavits. No one sees the clubs or the thousand starlings smoking at the lights. No one sees the old woman swinging cokes on the troopers' heads or falling from their sticks or the old man lunging in their affidavits or falling or the young one, the grandson, step in to catch the blow or take the gun. They see the flash and kickback, Jimmy Lee folding in the glass of the cigarette machine, tube light halo, electric hum, smoke feathers, singing glass, the grandfather's face arriving, arriving in the intermittent light. No one sees them drag him down the stairs and into the street, but that is where they found him. No one sees them beat so hard, clubs splinter skin and spit and blood through the haze of breath, bodies steam. 
spit half syllables that echo from the church face, the courthouse, tangled strange and having found each other whole as if the refugees of bone and skin and breath gathered in the eaves and hollows of the dark coalesce so their blows return, ghost wings at their ears. Blood beating arc lights flicker, feather tips of faint in the road's warm pitch, wings sheen in the splay of fingers. Starlings descending from the dark, assembling in his mother's warmth, having learned her hush now, Timbra, but saying things he can't make sense. He keeps saying their recurring sentences, what he hears in the whisper songs at the lips of his ears. The doctors open him again, one last bullet, infection nesting there, the pavement warm beneath, pulse of footfall, wings. Dark beats in the overhead lights till the room is night and sheen that folds from stars, thin sky into Selma's oaks and the girders of the bridge and the church's steeples and into all the pines from there to Marion gathering in the stands around the farm where his grandfather follows the preachers back through the woods. February silvers all their bruises, breath curls into the pines, into the murmuring dim and when they slow, everything is quiet, and he can see the towns, the map forming on their lips. And when they speak, he sees their mouths are full of birds. I think I'll read one more uh, poem about that length, and then do we do Q&A? What, what do we do? Okay. <clears throat> I'll read one more poem, and then... Uh, you can ask me a question or ask me to read another poem or to go away or anything like that. Uh, the very first poem I read referenced the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham in September 1963. Um, it's clearly a very pivotal moment. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the Spike Lee documentary, Four Little Girls. Um, and if you haven't, I recommend it to you. Um, there, were, there were immediately suspects for the crime, but... Um, for various reasons. Um, it took 14 years to bring the first of them to trial. Um, and only when a particular witness kind of broke and uh, brought forth some key information. So this poem is, is about that trial, State of Alabama versus Robert E. Chambliss, 1977. That's called The Small Birds of Sound. When they come, filling the yard with their overheard, broke glass catastrophes of voice, overcrowded party line. He lets the screen door clap to see them plume, then settle back to the fence, aftershocks of crowd and wail. When they come, he says again, he was home at breakfast, radio preacher doing love thy neighbor, and then the bomb. Just ask the wife, the silence in the TV's cathode glow, slowly fills with questions as starlings shudder light, then weigh the lines, voices tangled in their claws. They had him buying dynamite, a case he says he passed along. Then the other's car behind the church, the four men dome lit in early dark. Now all they have is years of brag and noise, an alibi, a quiet in which the trail's confused. At times it seems he wasn't real, that he was no one, a story everyone had heard, just not the end. That he was different men, one arm with a bomb, another making calls miles outside of town, a fog and exhalation scattering when seen. When the niece appears, long silence ready to break into small birds of sound, the court is held breath when she steps into the box and says how she heard them at the table the night before, beneath the naked bulb, thick with beer, cards down and laughing, when he leans through the light and says, wait, just wait. Come Sunday, they'll beg us to let them segregate. Then everything stills, and she sees the lights flicker slow, and the whole room dims. What he said gathers where she said it, a cloud beneath the tube lights beat. He breathes in a dark that nests in the wreck of his mouth. 
Then the wife rises from her couch, Lord have mercy, pulls the curtains, and the girlfriends appear without their alibis, and the neighbor who saw the sticks appears, in the park where water spread like angels in the photographs of the hosed, the beaten, the harassed. The park slowly fills with starlings, iridescent wings, creeling silence, a murmur, a congregation's rising, now a certain quiet's gone. And Kilby, all he'll say is he gave the dynamite, he said the thing, they'll have to find the others on their own. In another cell, someone is humming, we shall overcome. Laughter down the line. Quiet crowds his throat, they see it pulsing there. He can rise at night once the singing stops and look out over Jenkins Creek, a stream of cooling steel toward Montgomery, Selma, where no bomb could stop them coming, where they slept in open fields and filled the marble steps as Wallace eyed them through the blinds. Some nights the ground is moving beneath the clouds, the earth, their waiting bodies, their hard black stone. Cool. Thank you.